All right, Alexander, let's do an update as to what is going on in Ukraine. And uh, let's start with what is happening on the front lines. Um, Kherson, Avdiivka, uh, where else? Kupiansk, Bakhmut, maybe. But I think Avdiivka and Kherson are the big, uh, the big focus points with what's going on on the front line. Though I think the Russians are they're putting pressure all along the entire, the entire front line in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the counteroffensive is is over, and the Russians are now in active defense. Those are the words uh, that Putin used in active defense. Your thoughts? Uh, absolutely. And just just to say that, um, you know, even as we're making this program, there are uh, reports now from the Russian media and from the Kremlin that Putin has just gone to Rostov and he's gone to the military headquarters there. And there's pictures of him with the overall Russian commander, General Gerasimov. So, you know, this is a succession of meetings have happened. Get, Shoigu went to the headquarters a short time ago. Now Putin is going. Clearly the Russians are working on things. And I've noticed that Russian officials, Russian military officials, Shoigu, Gerasimov, others, are now talking about our plan or plans. So clearly they have a strategy. Of course, they're not telling us what it is, but they do have a strategy. So what's been going on on the front lines? Well, we've been hearing for weeks about a uh, Ukrainian um, cross, uh, a crossing of the Dnieper from the West Bank of Kherson region to the East Bank, pushing towards Crimea from there. And over the last couple of days, we've seen something that could perhaps be that or perhaps start with that. Um, we have had a number of small groups of Ukrainian troops trying to cross onto the East Bank. Um, we're not talking about large numbers. We're talking about, you know, people in numbers, the dozens or scores rather than hundreds and certainly not thousands. And they, they seem to advance towards some village or other than the Russians' response and they push them back. It all for the moment looks extremely underpowered and um, frankly, very unconvincing. And I've been following what Russian commentators say, and they seem to think that they have this whole thing under control and that it isn't a serious threat to them, that they've pushed the Ukrainians back to the actual river uh, line. And uh, they do expect that the Ukrainians will continue to try to do this. But the Russians don't seem to be afraid that this is going to change the military picture in any substantial way. And there was, there's was, been points made about how the um, this is a much more difficult area for Ukraine to mount an offensive in than Zaporozhye region was, which is the main axis of Ukraine's offensive. And the offensive there has failed. So it's not realistic to imagine that Ukraine is going to achieve anything here. But nonetheless, it is going on. And the general view in Russia, and, you know, this is a Russian take. I, I mean, you know, I, I can only report it. The Russian view is that more than anything else, this is intended, uh, again, as a presentational thing. You say that, well, we may not have broken through elsewhere, but we're making... We haven't given up on our offensive yet. We're still crying with these cross-border raids across the Dnieper. So far, they look more like raids than anything else. And as I said, it doesn't look particularly significant. Now, what is happening in other places looks much more serious. And the big battle at the moment, far bigger than anything that we're seeing in Kherson, where, as I said, we're talking about numbers of troops in, in the dozens not even the hundreds. What well, the big battle is taking place around Avdeevka. And here there's been an awful lot of fog of war, which is you would not is unsurprising. But the Russians resumed the big offensive towards to try and circle Avdeevka that they started back in March. That was then put on pause whilst the Ukrainian offensive was underway. Now they've restarted it. It's clear that here we are talking about tens of thousands of troops fighting 
on each side. Now, the Ukrainians have made many claims about destroying hundreds of Russian tanks, uh, thousands, <laughs> hundreds of Russian armoured vehicles, having killed thousands of Russian troops. There is no independent confirmation of this. People who understand these things say that the video evidence doesn't corroborate it. The reality seems to be that the Russians are gradually, incrementally, methodically clearing the Ukrainian fortifications. So they've apparently taken something called the slag heap, which you can actually see. It's near this big factory, which is now a major fortress. They've apparently gained control of it, or at least gained control of part of it. They've gained control of something else called the waste heap. I'm not going to discuss these things in detail, but they do seem to be making, actually, progress. And we're starting to see, on some Ukrainian telegram channels, worries about this and concerns that, at some point, over the next couple of weeks, there is a real risk that Avdevka could be completely encircled and that the Ukrainian troops there might be trapped. And the Ukrainians now are in a difficult position. Do they rush troops to try to hold the line in Avdevka, in which case they might weaken their positions on other front lines, where, as you absolutely rightly say, the Russians are piling on the pressure, they're counterattacking in the south, they're counterattacking around Bakhmut, they're putting more pressure around Kupiansk. Do they redeploy troops from these places? Do they pull their troops out of Avdevka and accept the loss of that town? Do they commit their troops to a further long stand in Avdevka and risk another Bakhmut in which we have a kind of repeat in Avdevka of the Bakhmut meat grinder. So this does look like it's concerning for Ukraine. And there's even reports that they're redeploying troops from the south towards Avdevka in order to try to hold the line there. So this is what's happening. The Russians are gradually, steadily piling up more and more forces along the front lines and pushing the Ukrainians in various places. And the main focus at the moment appears to be Avdevka. Yeah, and the Aletsky regime, their main focus is how do you get more money? And so, um, I, I, yeah, I imagine that, that they're going to have to move uh, military assets towards Avdevka, but you know that the Alensky regime would much prefer to to put all of uh, all of its force, whatever it has, towards uh, Kherson in order to gain whatever ter territory it can gain, in order to uh, convince the collective West to give it uh, more money. In this case, the sixty billion that Biden would like to hand over to the Alensky regime. So, I mean, this this. For, for the Aletsky regime, this is a, a pretty pretty bad uh, choice that he's uh, he's faced with, and uh, I guess that's why the Biden White House is is in a hurry to get uh, money to to the Aletsky regime because the the more this drags on, uh, the worse this choice gets for for the Aletsky regime. I completely agree. It's also the reason, by the way, why the Biden White House uh, provided Ukraine with Attackums missiles. The the purpose of providing those Attackums missiles was to support whatever military operation it is that the Ukrainians are trying to conduct in Kherson region. So they attacked this big air base where the Russian helicopters are located. And the idea is put the base out of action, destroy lots of helicopters in order to facilitate the advance in Kherson so that we can then talk about a great victory and a continuation of the offensive. And uh, that way we can go convincingly to Congress and demand more money. Um, now, what I am hearing and uh, reading from people who understand these things better than I do and who've looked at the satellite photos is that the missile strike on the airbase that took place didn't actually do a significant amount of damage. Perhaps two helicopters were destroyed or perhaps damaged. But overall, 
it was again less effective than expected and the 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 russians now of course understand that the um attackums missiles are there they know roughly now where they are they're deploying these mig 31 jets to the black sea the mig 31s have enormously powerful radars and are designed to shoot down cruise missiles and we'll probably see more russian air defense assets being deployed capable of shooting down attackums missiles and i suspect that we will fairly quickly see that particular problem resolved certainly putin seems to think so yeah okay um and anything else that we need to talk about as far as what's going on on the ground or do you want to do you want to shift over a bit so you want to shift over so we could talk a bit about uh the geopolitical panic i guess that's taking place in and around ukraine specifically with the eu it seems like yeah. the eu and nato they're 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 in a in big panic mode because they understand that uh from the media side of things no one's really paying attention to ukraine and of course you have the 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 money situation which the eu has admitted without the united states uh they just can't cover uh ukraine's costs so uh, time is definitely working against uh, the entire collective west as far as project ukraine is concerned and and there is a panic that has set in yeah there's a panic and it's a very interesting panic because of course there's nobody coming forward and offering any kind of solution um th- they can't keep providing ukraine with um weapons i mean they they are now at the bottom of the barrel i mean they were admitting that themselves just a few just you know two weeks ago we had the um dutch admiral who heads you know nato's military committee he says we're out, um, we're now out of ammunition and of course we now have a war in the middle east and there's already now confirmation in axios that in terms of shells ammunition it's israel that gets priority which is inevitable i mean it, it, that is uh you know the inevitable political reality from this moment so it, it's all but impossible to keep the focus on ukraine it's all but impossible to keep ukraine supplied with the weapons it needs and of course they're conscious of this enormous build up that is taking place on the russian side so they're getting very 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 nervous very, very panicky about this and one senses that behind the scenes there's an awful lot of recriminations um underway but they have no plan they have no solution nobody wants to start any kind of serious negotiation process i think everybody's come to understand that the russians are not going to are not interested in this freeze proposal the russians have made it absolutely clear that that is absolutely not something that they will agree to so that has died a death and they just don't know what to do they're committed to this conflict indefinitely committed to this conflict they made all kinds of incredible assertions and claims about it but they have no answer they have no way of resolving it and of course if the united states does distance itself from this conflict which it probably will at some point israel being as we've said more important then europe is left hanging out to dry it has no way that it can turn things round by itself as even they are admitting so they're in a they're in a terrible mess and of course all of this is coming at a time when the european economies are in extremely bad shape and it isn't just the european economies by the way the western economies are generally i've come to the view incidentally that the reason interest rates are so high is because yields on bonds especially treasury bonds are very high and that is pulling up interest rates it's even more pro- that problem than inflation and the reason yields on bonds are so high in the united states and in europe is because under the pressure of the war and under the pressure of the economic crisis the the inflation crisis the reductions in um industrial output by the way in the united states industrial output apparently has been falling year on year 
for seven consecutive months. In, in the face of all of this, the only thing they know how to do is to keep spending. And budget deficits are widening. In the United States, it's around, it's over, it's going to end the year apparently at over 8% of GDP. The same thing is happening in Italy, apparently. And um, that's pushing up bond prices because people are nervous of lending to governments when they see the fiscal situation deteriorating in the way that it is and debt levels, government debt to GDP levels rising so alarmingly. But they're not able to do that thing, that single thing, which might, at least to some extent, alleviate the situation, which is end Project Ukraine. Because doing that would be to turn around and admit to their people, first, that Putin has won, which, of course, they can't do, not after all the things they've said to him, uh, about him. And secondly, um, their people would then ask, well, what was it all for then? What, what, why, why did we give up the, you know, the gas from Russia, the, impose all those sanctions, do all of those things, um, if the Russians are going to get what they want in Ukraine after all? So the Europeans are stuck. The administration is basically out of ammunition. And um, there is no real answer to this, no real solution. And if you listened to Putin in Beijing, he is becoming increasingly more confident. Yeah, he's making all kinds of deals with China. Actually, I think it was the Gazprom CEO who said that uh, the gas to China is going to replace all the gas that was going into the EU like within the next year. So, I mean... You know, Russia, Russia's fine. Siberia one, power of Siberia one, power of Siberia two. I mean, this is this is such a catastrophe for the collective West and uh, the EU leaders, if you want to call them that. Uh, they've led the entire European Union into into just such a such a debacle of of just epic proportions. Uh, here's a quick question to wrap up the video: What happens with Project Ukraine if? If Biden gets his way and 60 billion goes into the, the coffers of the Oletsky regime, which is not a definite because we all know the situation in the House. And uh, while all the, uh, the representatives in the House and in Congress would definitely support uh, whatever money is asked to go to Israel, Ukraine's a different uh, situation. And, and the House still does, does not have a speaker. Uh, Jim Jordan, two rounds, he's going to probably go for his third or fourth round and you know, that's not even a, a definite that he's going to become the Speaker of the House. And uh, the, the, the point of, of the, where everything is, is hinging on is money for Ukraine. But let's just say that somehow Biden finds a way to get $60 billion to the Oletsky regime. What, uh, what happens with Project Ukraine and uh, for Europe? It makes no difference. I mean, they, they'll, they'll burn through that money very fast. as they like they've burned through all the other money they've been given. I mean, they've been given... Well, I, I've lost track of how much the money they've been given. They've been du at least double the amount that Biden is asking for. And where has it brought them? What has it achieved for them? I mean, it hasn't won them the war. And it cannot win them the war. Their economy is now um, getting into an ever deeper problems. There's talk that um, they're going, the, the, the IMF is telling them to um, engage in budget cuts. The Europeans, as I said, are running out of fiscal road faster than the Americans are, by the way. So it, it will, as Putin put it, it will prolong Ukraine's agony by a few weeks and months. But that's all. If you, you know, the, the, the administration, the rhinos, <laughs> I can talk, talk about that. They're always talking about... Um, Ukraine being this wonderful investment, you know, it's a smart investment. You put your money there, you degrade your, uh, uh, you degrade the enemy, you degrade the Russians, you do all of those things. The reality is the diametric opposite. Sending $60 billion to Ukraine is throwing good money after bad. That's all it is. It's the, it's the worst investment that the U.S. The has made investment. and could make. Yeah, it's been Project Ukraine. The worst. 
It's destroyed the, 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 the entire Europe, European Union, and it's destroying the United States. Project Ukraine is destroying the collective West. Yes, yes. Plain and simple. But it, oh, yeah. but, but it, remains, it remains the overriding ob- ob- obsession. Even the Middle East crisis, I mean, this is, this is the astonishing thing about that article in the Financial Times uh, uh, that appeared recently about... Um, ex-diplomats worrying about the West's response to the uh, to the crisis in the Middle East. Their concern was not about the crisis in the Middle East. It was about the perception around the world about the West's project Ukraine. That people in the Middle East and in the global South would say, you know, you know, all that you're saying about the. Uh, project Ukraine. Why should we believe you, given what you're doing in the Middle East? So it, it, it remains the obsession. It, it, they continue to be as fixated with it as always. They can't give it up. Oh boy! All right, um, we'll we'll leave it there, I guess. Uh, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin and Twitter X and go to the Durant shop 20% off use the code the Durant 20 take care